There we go. That's me. Uh, my name is Gina Rossi. I've been a social worker in this community for many years. Um, and I've worked with Alzheimer's Services for many years as well. It's one of my, uh, mo one of the agencies that's closest to my heart. I have worked in the field of aging in many areas, including hospitals and with the state of Louisiana uh, and outpatient programs and inpatient programs. And I've always had a very uh, close connection with Alzheimer's Services as I, I've referred people there, but I've also counted on them for their guidance as well whenever I've come across a client that needed help. So um, I know that I'm talking to a wide variety of people in terms of their caregiving experience. Uh, some people may be caregivers who have been caregivers for a long time. Uh, and some of you are new to caregiving. And I'm aware too that in this audience that we have some interns and I welcome you all. I wanna say first, I really uh, am honored to be here because I, especially in everything that I've learned about caregivers is I'm very sensitive to your time and everything that is on your plate at this time, especially around the coronavirus. And this presentation is geared around the needs and what we can do to help caregivers who are, um, who are trying to function and still live, considering all the obstacles that uh, you're facing with coronavirus 19. So as I'm talking up, please uh, do not take anything I say as an insult because I'm aware that many of you are, that are oh, you know a lot of this already. You have certainly been to several presentations, you've been to workshops, and I wanna say you are the experts and I honor you today as the experts in caregiving. What I will be presenting is on things that I have read about, resources that I'm familiar with. You know, one thing I'm very, I'm very busy with is I wake up about 5.30 in the morning and I start reading. I look at resources, I look at what's new in caregiving, I look at what's new in dementia, and if anything here is helpful to you, then I want it to be there for you. If it's something that you're already familiar with and it's old news, then just let it go. But I hope that if you can just have one thing out of this presentation, that I'm happy with that. I'll be pleased that you've left with one thing. So I wanna say that uh, when people started talking about social distancing, uh, this is what they thought was gonna be happening. And I will be honest with you, this is not social distancing for anyone I know. As delicious as it looks and as I will, as intriguing and inviting, most caregivers do not have the luxury of this for social distancing. Not just caregivers, but anybody still in the working world. This is something that I wish that you had. I wish that people could have this luxury to relax to. Unfortunately, this is not a reality. And if some people think that this is what is happening right now with a lot of people, then we know they're wrong, right? So coronavirus came at a time when absolutely no one needed any additional stressors if you're a caregiver. Caregiving alone in terms of having to be responsible for a person, even if you are the at-home caregiver, even if you're the caregiver at a distance, all of those stresses, emotional, physical, financial, are very hard to deal with. And then comes corona. So these were additional stressors that no one needed. People now started to have to worry about what is gonna to happen to my loved one if something happens to me, requiring us to be very, very careful when we leave, having to wear the gloves, having to wear the mask, all of that additional stress was, that was on top of everything that you already have on your plates. And then what is happening to our external help that may not be available? Because a lot of caregivers depended on people to be able to help them to be there so that they could manage and continue to live and assist their loved one. But without that external help because of the additional concern or stress that, that, that somebody else might become infected or you know, infect our loved ones, it created additional obstacles. And then where he's like, how am I gonna manage getting groceries, medicine and basic necessities? And don't forget, oh my God, toilet paper. Clorox, as if we didn't have enough on our plate already for caregivers, and now they have to worry about this. 
And then one of the things we recognize about caregiving is that always, no matter what, there always seems to be additional financial expenditures. You may be caregiving for somebody that has some resources, but for some reason, there are continuous things that come up that caregivers end up spending. And now, for a lot of caregivers who are at that age where they're into their retirement, a lot of their 401 is compromised, the concern about the stock market. And for caregivers who are working and who are no longer employed because of corona, this was an additional stressor. Many of you may have loved ones in a nursing home. And what we've heard about the situation that certainly people who are in nursing homes at are at are a higher level of um, risk, that's an additional stressor that no one needed. And then I have to say this, caregivers, older adults, we're starting to feel like they're, we're being left behind. As we, are, as we are faced with the question, do we put aside the needs of older adults so that we can focus on the economy? And with having governmental authorities actually say, the Lieutenant General, the Lieutenant Governor of Texas, who actually said that the economy may be more important than our loved ones, started to create an additional concern for people that were they gonna be left behind and were they going to be dealing with this on their own so that we could focus on the economy? And then of course, how long is this gonna go on? One of the things we know about stress is uncertainty makes things worse. So I found this infographic. I found it really helpful because I use it with the clients um, because it presents things. Um, it helps them know that they're not alone. It helps them realize that they are, there's nothing wrong with them. This is a normal response they're having to the stress. It is triggering mental health issues for everybody. If I am presenting as if I don't have any of these issues, I want a full out disclosure. I have also dealt with all of these anxieties and insecurities during coronavirus, and it's hard not to. When we're bombarded with this in the news, the newspapers, and the total focus of conversation is this, it's very hard not to. So please, caregivers, all of you who are working with caregivers, recognize this for the caregivers and help them know that this is not a failure on their part, that they're feeling this additional anxiety or feeling fear or concern. So I found this in, from the Kaiser, Kaiser Family uh, Health, let's see, that's the Henry, Henry Kaiser Family Foundation, uh, gives a very good uh, weekly email that I sign up for. And this was March 25th, so it's a while back, but some of this is still very pertinent to what people are going through. And they talk about 72% of the people that they surveyed said that the virus was a, a significant disruption in their lives. 39% of them had lost job or income. 45%, this is a big number, 45% said it had affected their mental health negatively. And what's worse is the continuous, is the unknown. 74% were still worried about the worst coming. 79% were worried about the, a, re a recession. And 82%, remember when this was happening around March, people were worried that the healthcare that we depend on for our loved ones being there, 82% of us were worried that our nation's healthcare was going to be overrun. So, I use this. I found this. Actually, this came to me on Facebook. You know, one of the things I tell people about social media is, you know, limit your time with social media. Be aware of it because it can make you very stressed. But there are some very good things happening on social media, too, to help you uh, face this and to help you deal with this. But I found this a very helpful, a very helpful um, poster. Uh, and I share this with the clients. And it says, I to be aware of things that I cannot control so that they can let go of these and things that they can control. So it is very helpful to caregivers to start to put aside or list or recognize in some way things that they cannot control. 
um, other people's motives, if other people are following the rules of social distancing, you know, toilet paper, if it's out there, what are they going there are some things that are not within their control, how others are reacting. But what they can do is they can turn off the news. I'm going to tell you really honestly, I found myself today even reading on, um, reading on the news in my, on my iPhone, reading news about coronavirus, and also in the background, having the news on about all the statistics until I recognize uh, what, what am I doing here to myself? Uh, these are exactly things that I was going to be teaching the caregivers to not do. But it's very easy to fall into that. What we can control is our attitude, how we ourselves follow the CDC recommendations. We can't help what others do, but if we know that when we go out there, we're putting our gloves on, we're putting our mask on, we're washing our hands, those things are within our control. And we can feel better knowing that I am doing some things to take care of myself. Things like doing your own social distancing and finding things to do at home. This is finding fun things to do at home. And honestly, we recognize this uh, might be Pollyanna for you. You may not be doing fun things at home. You probably have a lot of responsibilities that are heavy duty. So I want to talk a little bit about resilient caregivers, you know. I've always been, um, I've always associated the word resilience with soldiers because I was a military and I see resilience in, in warriors, people who go to the battlefield, people who have uh, horrific stories and are post-traumatic and we want to help them build resilience. We want them to build some inner resources, some strength so that they can go on and continue in their mission. And now this has come, this word has come to all of us, and it's come to you as caregivers, we want you to be resilient. Um, resilience is really the ability to bounce back from negative emotional experiences. Many of you have had negative emotional experiences. It's just living with and dealing with and having to help loved ones live with dementia. And then you have additional negative emotional experiences now with simple things like getting necessities, going out to the grocery store, um, going to the bank. So we're wanting you to be resilient. And in this presentation, I'll be, talk about, I'll be talking about some things that will help you be resilient. Um, again, some of these things you're aware of, you know, and, but if any of these are helpful to you, then I'm happy. And actually what this says, um, this says I'm stronger because I had to be. I'm smarter because of my mistakes. I'm happier because of the sadness I've known. And now I'm wiser because I've been wiser because I learned. And that's all of you. Just reminding everybody, these things that we're teaching you to take time out for yourself, this is, this is a prescription. This is as if it were coming from a doctor. It's not selfish. It is a necessity. So first thing, you've got to be more comfortable with asking. I mean, just flat out asking, asking for drive up services, asking for delivery services, asking for someone to bring your mail or your newspaper to your door, asking for someone to pick up groceries. In many neighborhoods now, there's a neighborhood link or similar kind of social media and communications where there are people who are willing to do this for you. And if there's not, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, um, I am a caregiver or I'm here at home. And if anybody's going down to the Rouse's or the Winn-Dixie or Albertsons, would you please let me know and maybe you could do a favor for me. I'd be very appreciative. You have got to be able to be comfortable asking that. And it is a place of courage for you to recognize that. I found this information. Um, this was a one page sheet that I had gotten um, that I was doing presentations for caregivers. It's from the National Family Caregivers Association. And I regret that I've never come across it again. Thankfully, I had, uh, I had this typed up, you know, from the form years ago. And it, what it, the purpose of this was, was for caregivers to have immediately available of some, a list of things that people could do for them. Because oftentimes people will ask a caregiver, what can I do for you? Or let me know if you need anything. And then the person is there and perhaps they're not, they're not prepared. So they don't know what to say. 
And a lot of times people will say, um, uh, let me know if I can help you with, and the person, the caregiver may not say anything, but if you have available, if you want to help caregiver, here's a list of some things that you can offer instead of waiting to be asked, because a lot of caregivers still can't ask. But if you're the caregiver, have a list. Say something like, you know what, I would like to have um, help with a ride to a doctor's appointment, or if you know somebody that can mow my lawn, or I need the house cleaned, or I need some shopping, or you know, if you know maybe it can be a regular caregiver aide just to help me, or I just need somebody to check in with me. Have a list that's pertinent for you, what you need so that you're not caught off guard. And then if you're helping, or if you know a caregiver, here's a list of some things, and you probably can come up with a list, of, an additional list to this, about what might be a way that you could be available or helpful, or your family members could be helpful or available. So let's just talk about some basics, and this you will know, but it is helpful to hear again and to refresh for yourself. You've got to take breaks from reading or listening to the news media. And as I'm telling you this, I'm telling it to myself. Because when I tell you this, I'm recognizing myself, this is a good reminder for all of this. It is so easy to get caught up into what might be the newest breaking news. But the truth is, do you really think you're gonna miss it? Because won't they play it again? Won't you hear it again? It's still gonna be there, you, I promise you, you're not gonna miss it, you will hear it again. Then, then again, very important as well is take care of your body. Take deep breaths. Some of you are going to need to learn how to do this, how to do uh, deep breathing, belly breathing, and there's a lot of apps out there and resources that we'll talk about that will teach you and then have some very good techniques and tools. Stretching, meditating, praying, whatever you're comfortable with. And eating healthy and well-balanced meals. We know that if you're eating strictly carb, strictly sugar, you're going to start shaking. Your thinking will not be as good as it is if you were having vegetables and protein. So you cannot function if your body is not nourished. We talked a little bit about meditation, yoga, spirituality, eating healthy meals, exercise, and sleep. And then finally, you've got to find some time to unwind you've got to find one thing that you can do to pull away that you can enjoy and then connect with others. And um, in this presentation, I'll tell you about what are some ways that are available to you to connect. Um, and certainly we recognize that sometimes you might need uh, some more serious help with this or more than just a reminder. And if that's the case, you need to talk to your healthcare provider and they can help you with that. This is information I've adapted from the cdc.org site. That's available to you. They have a lot of good resources and I invite you to take a look at that. So here are some additional tools that I wanna let you know about. Some of you may or may, may not be aware that uh, the state of Louisiana, uh, we had a grant where we connected with and we funded Tai Chi lessons for persons that were going to be working with older adults. And actually, Alzheimer's Services of the Capital Area participated in this. So they're aware of this. And this is going to be something that will, there will be another opportunity. But we recognized Tai Chi as an evidence-based program to help people in not just their balance, but their being able to deal with stress, uh, their, their, their stretching, and their health, their overall health. And we chose Dr. Lamb, um, who's a very well known, uh, very, you know, very well known in the Tai Chi community. He's actually from Australia, but he trains people nationwide. And Dr. Lamb has these videos available that are free. And so that's the website that you see there. Um, I took this train as well. I found it helpful. Um, and I found it especially helpful to be able to to share with other adults because we funded people around the community to teach this. And we look forward to this being taught more and more. So keep your eye out for that, eye out for that, but also be aware of this for yourself. And meditations. I found this meditation um, app on the Family Caregiver Alliance site. Um, it's a these are about seven that are on YouTube from Family Caregiver. And this is probably one of my favorites, uh, my favorite sites. Um, the first one on this YouTube is very, very pleasant, very relaxing, and it has 
just some lovely music in the background as well. A lot of times people say, well, I just don't know how to meditate. I don't know where to begin with that. Well, these are guided meditations that will help you in that process and they'll walk you through how to do that. And then something else that I, uh, that I refer clients to is to, to journal. Um, journaling helps them put down some things that maybe are on their mind that if they can write it down and say, well, I'm going to take a break from that. I'm not going to worry about that because I know it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's addressed. I've written this down and I'll come back to it so that I don't forget it. Because a lot of times things are obsessing in our mind because we're afraid that we're going to forget something or we want to deal with it. But if we say, you know, that's something that I'm going to save for my journal. I'm going to put this in my journal, write it there, and um, I can deal with it wherever, maybe when I'm in a better frame of mind. One of the things that journaling does as well is it, it allows us to go back a bit in time and look at where we were at a certain point. Because we may not realize just how much we've done during that period, or we may not realize how far we've come, but if we can go back with maybe more wisdom now, with more experience, with more calm, and we look at where we were, we recognize that, you know, I've, I've done a pretty good job. I'm doing much better. Because when I look back at my journal, I see that I was very anxious. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't focus. And that's really not where I am right now. But otherwise, if you didn't look at that journal, you may not be able to identify how much better you're doing with some of these resources that you're using. So you can do journaling with, listen, you can use a simple book. You can just use a spiral notebook. Or some people maybe want a decorative journal. I did find a couple for people who need a little bit more structure because some people have told me, I opened that spiral journal and that spiral notebook and I didn't know where to begin. I just could not face a blank book. So these are some books that are a little bit more structured and can guide you a little bit better. The Book of Me, I really like this. This is uh, written by a local uh, person. Well, actually, she's from uh, Louisiana. She lives in Monroe, and her name is Christine Gabor Atwood. By the way, I'm not getting any kickbacks from any of these journals, but they were ones that I'm familiar with and that I like and that I've recommended. But she has an, and it's like a calendar and you can write what you want to do during the day so that you can be writing things. But it also, there are some positive psychology type statements that will, that will kick off, you know, some good ideas for you and help you think of things in a different way when you open the book and you see these pages that are recommending or guiding you to think in a different way. Then there's another one and it's called the five minute journal. Both of these, by the way, are on Amazon. Um, the five minute journal is a little bit pricier. I think it's about maybe $38, but it's a very nice, you know, kind of a hardback. Uh, the book of me vision planner is, um, it's a paperback, but it's a, it's a nice solid quality. The five minute journal also, it will guide you in what are some things that you might want to begin with in your journaling. It will ask maybe, you know, what are some good things that happened today? Or what's the best thing that happened today? Or what would make tomorrow even better? So that it can focus and guide you if you need a little bit more help with that. So this is just a picture of them for you. The Book of Me, um, and that's on Amazon, and the Five Minute Journal, and it's a hardback. And um, that's by Alex Icon. I, I really don't, I think it's Icon and UJ Ram, Ram does. So one of the things that we want you to, when you leave here is to remind yourselves that social distancing is really physical distancing. It is not distancing socially because we want you to be very aware of the concern that we all have about loneliness for people. Loneliness is one of the most dangerous things. There have been lots of research about, you know, how it can affect you um, medically. Um, Cigna did, Cigna, the insurance company, had a 2020 loneliness index they did, uh, actually just in January 2020, before we even knew it was going to, what we were going to become uh, of our situation. And they said that Americans feel lonely at a chronic level, and about half of baby boomers report feeling loneliness. I mean, half of baby boomers, that means we know that the sense of being lonely and distancing yourself can have the medical equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So let that sink in. 
there was also a study done by Humana in 2019, um, and they also targeted loneliness as being tied to poor health. Then finally, there was a Medicaid advan Medicaid Medicare Advantage, and they did a survey, and they found that people who were discharged from the hospital, and when they went back and looked at who had reported feeling lonely, people who were reported feeling lonely were four times more likely to be re readmitted within the year. And of those people, six and 10 were more likely to develop dementia. So if that alone doesn't remind you about the importance to be connected, make more calls, send cards, um, set a time to agree on to say, you know, even though we're not talking, let's all say a prayer at eight o'clock tonight, or let's do a meditation tonight at eight o'clock, whatever you're comfortable with, and to be involved in support groups. The support groups now have gone online. There are also support forums and Zoom is available, FaceTime is available. If some of you are, are just new and this is your first time using Zoom, congratulations. Many of us had to get to that threshold as well. Don't worry, you're not gonna break it. You are gonna have to be here in technology with the rest of us because hopefully this technology will be a help to you in many other ways. To, it's telehealth is here to stay. We know that now it can be effective. And this is gonna be something more convenient for you. You'll be able to have Zoom meetings with doctors, with social workers. And as we get more and more accustomed to this connect in this way, yeah, we know it's not the best, but it, it can be very effective. And FaceTime, I will, I will share with you that my parents who are 87 and 89, um, I bought them a, uh, iPhones for Christmas. And thank God at Christmas, I taught them how to use FaceTime. That is one of the best things I did. So now, now wherever they're living in Texas, I can easily communicate with them on FaceTime and we have at least face-to-face -face connection. Do not fear technology. Really work with it, practice it, and get better at it. It will work for you, I promise. So I want to talk about some sites, some resources that I'm familiar with. Uh, this is my house. It's called my Alzheimer's team. My Alzheimer's team, and this is actually a component of something called my health team. And they're out of San Francisco, and they have several my teams. There might be like my Parkinson's, my fibromyalgia, but this one is specifically related to Alzheimer's. Um, and th they allow you to, you can customize your profile, you can um, tell your story, and it offers you a way to connect with others who are also specifically, um, you know, wanting to talk about Alzheimer's. So I invite you to look at that. It's just called my Alzheimer's team. Um, I also want to talk about the Alzheimer's Foundation of America. Now, these are what I'm sharing with you. Oh, I will tell you when I went that I'm familiar with. This is this is one that I am familiar with. I actually did call them. I wanted to know about them. I wanted to know how they were trained. And I'm pleased to say this is one that they're staffed by all licensed social workers. So if you have a concern, you know, sometimes volunteers do an excellent job and we have a lot of volunteers who have a lot of good experience um, and, but there are also agencies that choose to use all licensed social workers this is one this is a toll free option for you um, and they also have a live chat and let me tell you why this is important for you to know about i know that some of you might be very uh you're very close to the people that you are caregiving for maybe they're often in the room with you and you need to talk about something but you are you're not wanting to talk with an ear shot of of them maybe you need a little bit more privacy and it's just not the right time but this gives you a time a chance to chat so you can be typing your concerns or what you want to say, you can be typing this in a chat and they will respond to you so that you have the privacy you need because it's just chatting you and them. Uh, they do have, this is not a 24 hour line. They do have designated times and you can see those here, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Monday through Friday. And then on Saturdays and Sundays, they stop at three. Be aware of this. I hope that some of you are able to use this. I, I was very pleased when I, when I talked to them. So this 
is one of my favorite agencies. This is the Family Caregiver Alliance. They are one of the oldest. They're out of California. Um, for educators, uh, for those of you that are wanting to learn and attend webinars, I will tell you they have some of the best education that I've come across. Uh, and, you know, sometimes they offer CEUs for those of you who are social workers, and sometimes they don't, but they're, it's very good uh, information. But they also offer a free social network, and they offer a lot of resources and practice tips. Um, and you can see just on this um, screen right here, they've been around for 40 years. One of the things I also like about them is that they have great policy and advocacy opportunities. They are up to date with all the things that are happening in policy and advocacy that you as caregivers and us as social workers need to be aware of. They also, besides their support groups for caregivers, they also offer specialized unique type care, uh, caregiver support groups for the LGBT community. They want you to know that if you're a lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, you're not alone. They will be there to help you and they have support groups for this population as well. So I'm glad to be able to, to pass this on to you, uh, this information. These are some apps that I found and that I've worked with. Um, you might be familiar with some of them. For example, you might be familiar with the Caring Bridge, but the Care Zone was an app. I call them and I talk to them, and I, I'll tell you why, because I was a little bit concerned. They were offering so many things that I wanted to be sure that this was actually a free app and that there was not a, you know, some sort of a additional link or there was gonna be something connected. Not that that's a bad thing because there are some of these um, websites that are connected or are um, partnered with uh, for-profit agencies. You know, there again, you just need to be aware of it, but there's still a lot of good information you can get from them, even though they are partnered with, uh, with for-profit agencies. But the Care Zone, I call them, and um, I hope you can see this uh, clear here. Um, they, they do, this is an app you can go to to help coordinate the care of your loved one in a in a one site that your people who are family or friends they can go to that site and you can schedule and you can have a shareable calendar so they can see what's on your calendar so if they want to help or if you have a a real need on the calendar somewhere there they can see it for you what i thought was very good about this is they have a pharmacy um, a, an additional pharmacy opportunity where you can get your meds through their pharmacy. It doesn't cost any more that you only have to pay your regular copay. So it allows you to have a place all in one place, all in one site. So check that out. That might be something that you find helpful. Maybe not. Just be aware of it. The Caring Bridge. Now this has been around a long time and you've probably seen it because you've maybe been invited there whenever you've been uh, familiar with a friend who has a chronic illness or somebody who's in hospital or somebody who's in a terminal illness, they'll often use a Caring Bridge to keep people updated about the, the person's status. Um, I, I happen to use this. I, I like using it. Um, I don't use a lot of the other additions they have, I only use it to uh, get updates. So the last one on here is called Lots of Helping Hands. I have used this myself. Um, this is, uh, it's actually operated by Alzheimer's Association and I really like this. I had a friend who really needed some help organizing so that she could help, so that she could help people who needed to help her, who wanted to help her, but she just didn't know how to put together the plan, what to say or how to ask for help. So even though this was originally designed by Alzheimer's Association, I picked it up and I used it and um, I developed, a, a, it's called, I don't think it's on here, but I have permission to let you know, I used, I developed Melvin's team. Uh, and Melvin is somebody who had a brain tumor and I helped his wife, um, Actually, this is March 20th because that's the, the calendar that I could pull up. I couldn't find the old calendar that I used. And it allows you to develop calendars and to even, if you can see the arrow here, to even put and color code where help is needed, where you already have help, where there's some occasions that you need 
something, uh, you know, what are some, maybe a doctor's appointment or from where, to, where to put that you yourself are scheduled. And so in the calendar, I would color code and I would tell people, Kay needs a ride to doctor's appointment for Melvin. Kay needs medication or, or Melvin needs medication picked up. Or Wednesdays at two o'clock would like social visits so that on Wednesdays at two o'clock, anybody could see that would be a good time to visit Melvin. It would also give maybe some respite to Kay so that she could take a break and go do something and somebody was sitting there with Melvin. It was something she found helpful. So it's divided into the month, the day, the task even. Take a look at that and see if that's something that will give you some help of your caregiver. Um, this is just another one of the pages that divides out the activities, you know, giving rides, preparing meals, visits, coverage, uh, and miscellaneous. Like I said, we, we color coded things so that people could take a look so that when somebody said, is there anything I could do? She could immediately say, I'm going to email you the lots of helping hands and you can go right to that. Um, my dear friend, my family member, and you can look at that and you can pick out what's a good time for you to help and just pick something on this calendar. And that made it easier for the friend that wanted to help and it made it easier for Kay as well. So she didn't have to feel like she was, you know, going back in her mind or, you know, you know not caught off guard. She knew where to direct them. So support groups, I know that if you're a caregiver, you've seen the benefit of these. Alzheimer's Services of the Capital Area is continuing to have support groups and they all, they've all gone to online. Um, and oops, let me go back up. So if you have been in support group, um, the support groups are still there, but they're now online. Um, make sure you get with Ellen and her emails uh, on here. When we finish up, Ellen can, can jump on and she can talk about support groups. But the support groups are still at the same time, the third Monday, the fourth Friday, the Saturday, and then the second Friday is the, um, the younger onset support group. So those have not gone away. Those are still there for you. You can still benefit from these. Remember, we're not used to doing this but you can get used to it the more you do it. Alzheimer's Association. Alzheimer's Association is the national uh, branch of Alzheimer's and there's a Louisiana chapter. They also have a support line. We go back up, Alzheimer's Services also has a support line um, and it's managed by the staff. So during those hours, you can call them and they will return the call if they're not immediately available. Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's Association, has the 24 7 helpline and that's the so there's the phone number there for you to see 1-800-272-3900 um, i did travel to alzheimer's association to chicago and i saw the setup and i actually was right outside the cubicles where they were all working and and um, this is something that can be very helpful to you as well especially if you are um, wanting help off hours they have also online support forums here again, the benefit of an online support forum, sometimes people feel more comfortable maybe not talking to somebody, but they're very good at writing it out, or writing out their feelings. And so these caregiver forms right here, you can write into the online support forms and you can do it during the day and maybe you're that your loved one or the person that you need some privacy from may be there around, but you still have the privacy of being able to participate and it's in the written form. So that's available to you. These are additional resources. I want you to know about self-care. We've talked about that. And this is a live chat. Um, this is help for Alzheimer's communities. And this is uh, from Senior Home Instead. Yes, so, but it still offers you the opportunity to be a part of live chat. That's what it looks like. It's called Help for Alzheimer's Family, and they, they are partnered, um, and they have some very good chats. They're very educational. I've participated in this. I think, you know, a lot of the chats are related to stress management, coping skills that you all would find helpful.
And I want you to know about this is a national uh, SAMHSA line. Uh, you can call them at any time. You can text and they will have a communicate. They will have a dialogue with you over text. If that's something that you feel comfortable with. If that's what you want. It's toll free. It's multilingual. Keep that in mind because we have more and more multilingual families moving into our community. Maybe people are Spanish speaking or Chinese speaking and this is multilingual. I found this and I wanted to, this is available. This is an interesting option for some of you that maybe you want your loved ones or maybe you yourself want to somebody to check in with you. There is a cost. Uh, it's, it's the My Hello line. So you might be seeing this a lot. It's powered by www.lifebio, but this is a, there is a cost for this. It's not free. And what they will offer you is, or your loved one is a call once once a month four calls a month and for a hundred dollars actually the last time i looked at it was 119 for 100 about 100 119 dollars a month they will talk for up to 30 minutes with whoever and it's a chance for somebody to be called on a regular basis somebody to check in with them somebody to have some conversation if you feel like the person needs more time it's two hundred dollars a month and they'll talk for up to an hour you get four calls a month once a week and it's geared to people who are living at home and they need a check-in um, and their staff are trained. Um, I did, I've talked to them, their trained staff, and I asked, well, what if somebody needs more or what if you see that there's an issue or there's a problem, maybe the person sounds uh, not well or they sound different. And what they said was that they would then go to the person on, their, on the form who is listed as needing to be called. Maybe a family member needs to be called and said, hey, I just talked with your loved one and we're, we're seeing something that's a little unusual and we want you to know about it. This is for somebody that you are worried about that maybe needs more time and they need time to talk to somebody, they're lonely. This is an option for you. But again, there is a cost. And finally, I don't think that we should ever finish up without talking about some people on our very, very lonely place and they are not not able to deal with the situation. We want you to know that this is a phone. This is a 24 hour call, free and confidential. And it's the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Have that available for yourself or anyone that you might know. Um, we are very concerned about the high levels of depression, anxiety, anti-anxiety medicines being prescribed. It's, it's up like 34%. These people are trained to deal with some of the very bad places that people might be at some point and need additional care. And we want you to have this number. This is something I found. This is a, a freebie for you because I, I want you to know what, whatever resources I found out about. They're offering free masks for people with brain or spinal cord injury or disorders. And you would uh, email us to kim at biala.org, kim at biala.org. Make sure you give them your name, your address, and say that if you are the individual living with a disability or if you're the caregiver and how many masks you need. So it might take a couple of weeks. So this is something that you're interested in. I think you should do it fairly soon so it comes to you quickly. And just send that to kim at biala.org. This will be online so you, can, um, you, you will have us available to you when we finish up here today. So these are some uh, this is by uh, uh, Best Practice Caregiving. Best Practice Caregiving is a site that offers resources to people that need some online or telephone. All of these are lessons. Uh, they might have four people group or four person group or a nine person group. And they offer in person or telephone training. And the training is usually caregiving skills, but it, all, almost all of these also offer training about stress management. This is free, you go to, you know, you can click on this link, active caregiving, but this is up available here at the best, whoops, at the best practice caregiving site, and that will be there available for you. The first one, for example, is, is there, they'll offer four in-person or telephone group education. It includes skill building, but it also includes, um, you know, stress management. Best practice is a, is a collaboration between Family Caregiver Alliance. Remember I told you that was one of my favorite organizations, the Family Caregiver Alliance, uh, between that and the Benjamin Rush Institute on Aging. 
So those two very significant agencies have come together and uh, offered these online and telephone building resources. The second one, the African Americans Alzheimer's Caregiver Training, and that offers oops, and that offers 12 telephone sessions for African Americans. And then if you look on the right, these are online. And if you know, a lot of these are multilingual, including Spanish and Chinese. So get to know those uh, for yourself. If you're a social worker, if you're going to need to refer, be aware of these. And finally, I want to talk about something that is very empowering. One of the things that makes people feel better is when they've been able to do something power powerful for themselves or to make sure that they've been heard. And advocacy is something that every single person on this teleconference should be engaged in. And unfortunately, when we are meeting with legislatures, legislators, when we are doing th something of advocacy level, we rarely have the caregivers there. And guess what? We know why. Totally get it. You can't because you're busy. You have people that you're taking care of or you're working and taking care of people. I totally get it. But it's very important for your governmental your governmental representatives, that they are aware of your story. And if you can in any way take some power back by telling them what's going on or telling them what you need, you will feel better that you've done something important for yourself and your loved one. Alzheimer's Association, they are very much aware of this. Family Caregiver Alliance has very good sites for this. At the very bottom of this, you will see the the website, it's www.als.org, get involved. And if you go there, they will make it very easy for you to participate. Because sometimes this is intimidating or sometimes it's overwhelming. People don't know what to say, what to do. And it's so easy. They make it very easy for you. If, if you want to know who your legislator is, go to that govtrack.us. Put in your state, put in where your zip code is, and it'll tell you who your legislators are. Social workers, all of us, we should always know who our legislators are because we should always be advocating as well. But a lot of these have pre-prepared letters that you can use that are already done for you. And all you have to do is you can add in your own story. That would be great. But pretty much it has prepared and all you do is a click and you can sign it and you've done something for yourself that day. So this is a poem that a friend of mine, I have permission from her and her mother who's living with dementia. And at this point in her life, she is doing some nonstop poetry. And this is one of my favorite ones that she gave. It's loving is contagious, loving is not taught. Loving comes from living, in living you must walk. And you can see this is one of her most recent um, pieces of work. And I said, I really like this and I would like to share it. And I do have her permission to do that. So we're about to end. Just wanted to remind you, I appreciate everything that you do. I appreciate the bravery you've all had because 40 million caregivers out there and what you have done is you contributed to the country by taking care of loved ones. If you have loved ones at home or if not still being aware of and being involved with somebody that needs your care, and that helps all of us. So thank you, I honor you, I appreciate you, um, and I am very honored for your time today. So that's about it. Uh, you, um, if you wanna 